Good morning, everyone. So I'm a hacker. I may not look like a one, but that's intended. You will not expect an attack from me. So I think you all have the same feeling, so long story short, cybersecurity is better these days. I mean, we got more capabilities, better tools, more detailed threat intelligence, so we are safer now. But are we really? I have to say, it doesn't look that from my side, nor from these stats. Despite all those improvements, my team, and unfortunately the bad guys also, still managed to break in. Today in this session, I will hopefully show you four examples where we managed to break into monitored and supposedly secured environments. Bear with me while I explain how we managed to do this, and most importantly, why we succeeded. So, quick look uh, at our infrastructure uh, in the first place, so you, got the, you, you will understand what the defense is up against. As you can see, there's no single source that can be easily detected and blocked. The infrastructure is complex, uh, it contains multiple elements. The key elements of such infrastructure is we adopted the DevOps approach called infrastructure as a code. So we have scripts to recreate this, this, this infrastructure from the scratch. You can, you can take this down and we're able to put it back within a couple hours or, or less. Uh, the workload is distributed, so you won't see a single IP address doing a port scan on your environment. If you have rules that are based on volume and timing, they will fail. Burnable components. Uh, the red blocks on that diagram are assumed to be detected and blocked, but we don't care. Those are not actual malicious servers. Those are just proxies, and they can be easily replaced with a couple of seconds. And last thing, Switchblade is a concept developed by NSA. To put it in a simple words, if you will find something that you think is a mal mal malicious server, a hacker server, and you visit it, you will be directed to a normal web page because you don't know how to communicate with it. In order to see what's actually behind, you gotta know how to communicate with that, uh, with that Switchblade server. So, in the first example, we were tasked with a red teaming assessment. Our goal was to access the internal network and gain highest possible privileges. Our victim was a prestigious international college, uh, sorry, prestigious international education and research institute, and we were provided with nothing more than the target's name. The outcome is we got in. We've managed to get domain admin credentials. So t take a look at the red teaming process. It's similar to a penetration test, but with slightly different objectives. So first we got recon. This is the most important step. Next, we're trying to get in and achieve a persistence. Next, we're doing internal discovery. Next, we try to escalate. And at the end, we're doing post-exploitation activities, which resolves the final impact. All those steps are done with, the ev with defense evasion in mind. So we've done some reconnaissance uh, on our target, and most of this was open source intelligence. You actually won't believe how much information about you and your companies is out there on the internet. And we were able to gather that information without even communicating with your environment, so there's no way to defend against that. Actually, you can come to me after presentation. I'll probably be able to tell you your phone numbers, your kids' birthdays, your dogs' or cats' names. And I wonder how many of those are used as your passwords. I won't, okay, I won't check it. <laughs> so we found a couple of potential targets. Uh, we found even some more interesting stuff, in case you don't see it. It's probably a gambling portal installed on one of the subdomains of the victim, so you can imagine how this is admin works looks like there. We found 36 valid credentials from third party leaks, and by valid, I mean they will they were actually working on the target environment, not just those third-party websites. And those databases are available on the dark web, on the hacker forums, mostly for free if you know where to look for. So we got some initial foothold. We could, for example, do some internal phishing or business email compromise, but which is another path. We explored the attack surface even more and we found some vulnerable applications. We chose a one that didn't have a publicly available exploit, so there was no signature 
detections for antivirus. But there was a technical write-up for this one, so with little skills, we were able to create our own exploit, and this was a perfect for the task. Once we got in, we uploaded our custom malicious script, a so-called web shell. It's a script that allows us to execute commands from a web form. And in case some curious defender would find that script, they will see only a blank page there where we actually have our tools. Because again, as said at the, uh, at the Switchblade site, we, you'd gotta know how to communicate with this to see those tools. So we're in, it's time for escalation, uh, discovery and, and escalation. And in the first step, we're finding domain admin credentials in a clear text format in a file. And believe me, it's not that uncommon as you may think. So it practically was a game over at this point, but to have some a bit more sophisticated attack, we reverse engineered and exploited some other internal application that also stored domain admin passwords, reused, uh, not, uh, not a domain user, but the domain password, so the password was reused. For the post-exploitation, we uploaded our custom developed malware, is a command and control script for all all further operations, and all of this was developed with a defense evasion in mind, so we implemented obfuscation of code, we implemented in-memory code execution, we implemented encryption. We triggered no detection. No prevention actions were executed on us. By the time someone noticed some suspicious activity in that network, we were able to already wreak havoc. So we downloaded all users' password hashes. We escalated across multiple domains on that environment. We exfiltrated some sensitive documents and we encrypted the computers. We didn't, but we could. We did, if we, we would do that if we were the bad guys. Summarizing the problems. Uh, first, what I call unknown unknowns. You can't protect what you don't know about. So you gotta perform regular asset discovery and maintain an asset inventory. It showed up that some of the assets that we targeted were actually not monitored, not covered by, by the monitoring systems. And from that gambling side that we've seen, you can imagine that the IT was not even aware what they have in their environment. Problem number two, so sensitive files in a clear text. I mean, we see it multiple times on a, on a printers, on a notes, on the scripts, on the computers. And you can have a security clean desk policy, but it's hard to enforce it. So you can use something like data classification tools to identify where you store sensitive information. Third, you can have a good antivirus system, but as long as, as it's only signature based, it will fail for a custom malware, and it's not that hard to develop one. Use modern solutions like EDR, XDR. Also, uh, just for the note, antivirus can be simply disabled, and you won't see that. For the ADR and XDR, you can probably see something like this in a, a network logs in a SOC, in a CM solutions. And last but not least, password policy. And I will only say this. Please, please don't reuse passwords, and don't use administrative accounts for a daily task. Use multi-factor authentication whenever you can. Use additional accounts for daily activities. Another case is another red teaming assessment. Uh, also, this time, we were provided with nothing more but the victim name, a large European university. And the goal was to get behind the perimeter, get inside, and explore the attacker's possibilities. And we got in, and we also executed the malware uh, on internal assets from a low privileged user. So again, we've done some reconnaissance with open source intelligence, a lot of those actually. And again, we've found some leaked credential, this time actually over 5,000 passwords. And we validated around 5, 10 to 15% of the, out of those were valid on that environment. And just for the record, the bad guys only need, need one. On one of the endpoints we found sort of sandboxed remote desktop. It was supposed to allow the users to run only the whitelisted secure applications. So we logged in using the compromised, uh, the, the leaked password. And inside, we were able to escape the sandbox uh, using so-called kiosk mode breakout te technique. So you probably all know in the, in the stores, they have that like demo modes on the computer. So 
pretty much the same technique that we used. So we escaped the sandbox, and in the end, we were able to run any comment and any application on the system. This should not be possible. And bear in mind, no malware was used for that attack to get to this point. We just abused the trust of the vendor, of the client that the sandbox is, can, be, can be escaped. So the problems here, lack of threat modeling. So you, you need to understand the threat sources and threat boundaries and implement proper security at each one of them. You got to also understand the technology that you're using. The vendor providers for such a sandbox solutions inform their clients that the sandbox should not be used as a security boundary. But I see multiple times the platforms are deployed without even looking at the security guidelines provided by the vendors. And most of the vendors provide such, a, such a guidelines. Another case is uh, phishing. So not that exciting, but actually it is interesting how we managed to bypass the anti-phishing protection, not the user awareness. Uh, we, get, we had two cases here. So in the first one, we were able to bypass a uh, leading industry anti-phishing protection because of the problems, uh, because of the weakness, how it was implemented. So instead of the mails going through the anti-phishing uh, solution, we were able to send the emails directly to the mail server. And we abuse the fact that the mail provider creates uh, predictable alias names for the mail servers. And if any of you is using Office 365, you might take a look if you don't have a similar case. Second example, we, second case of phishing, we actually bypassed one of the basic protection mechanisms for the email protection, which is SPF, Sender Policy Frameworks. This policy should prevent everyone on the internet to send emails on behalf of any domain. And we abuse the fact that the provider of the email actually says to their customers to trust all the all, all the IP ranges their own as a trusted sender. So we simply bought a server at the provider and we were able to send the email from actual, uh, looking like an actual email from the victim. And ju just, just for uh, telling how normally we're, we're buying some similar naming domains, with, which is called typos, typos squattings, but sometimes it's, it's marked, it's highlighted by the mail clients. And this time, the email was actually looking like it was sent from someone on the victim domain. Summarizing the problems. Again, no malware was used here. And no, actually no sophisticated phishing techniques. You got to understand the security controls. You got to perform threat modeling and consult it with experts. And don't trust your third party provider's security assurance. You, you need to test it. You need to take it into account in your own security risk assessment. Last example was supposed to be a typical web application penetration test for one of the applications of a large software house. The outcome was that we were able to compromise all the client applications of that software house. We took control of their hosting environment and we even took control of their development environment. So not that boring at all. To quickly go through what happened, so we compromised the web application through like a normal cross-site scripting, typical case. Then we abused the trust between the web application and the development environment to infiltrate the development environment. Then we, again, we abused another trust between the development environment and the hosting environment. We escalated to the hosting administrator, uh, e exploiting some outdated application that was supposed to be only visible from the inside. And at the end, we were able to place malware in all the web applications hosted. We were able to leak the data of all the client applications the software house had. And we even were able to inject malicious code into every new application they will release because we exfiltrated, we compromised the development environment. And going through the problems, so first, there was too much trust. And as much as I don't like the buzzword, zero trust is a case here. So you can't assume that two of your owned assets can communicate without any additional verification because you own them. You gotta, you gotta 
check security and verify it at every point because at some point everything can be compromised. Don't reuse passwords. Again, we abuse actually the fact that the hosting environment and the de development environment use the same password. So there should be MFA used. The MFA would stop us, prevent us from using compromised passwords. And again, asset discovery. So we exploited an, an application that was outdated, but it was not used by the client, so they didn't assume it's risky but they should probably discover the application and remove it because it's not used. Summarizing, security is about layers, and you got to implement security controls at each of these layers, not just single one, because you, you need to remember that the impact is at the end, not in the middle. And it's not always about malware. And we have a spare minute, so an extra case, once you think your network is secure, then you gotta take a look at your physical security. Here, the team was able to get inside the biggest facility, electronics facilities in the Poland. We actually pretended to be a CCTV service. We had a legitimate purchase orders. Some kind person have left the open doors for us <laughs> and Another kind person have left us the access card so we could clone this one. There were network ports all over the place so we simply connected our devices and, and were able to do some, uh, some internal hacking. And the last thing is a little device that is in our internal arsenal. I have it here. It's called, called Flipper Zero. The device can clone any radio signal or near field, so access card and we can reuse the signal. So if any one of you can want to try it, you have remotes to your gates or anything, you can try to, to just press it and see if I can capture the signal. You're terrified of it. <laughs> yeah, actually, I got something. So I can now save and reuse the signal to do whatever it is doing. <laughs>